Welcome everybody that made it out for our monthly um, Black Forum Long Range Recovery Committee meeting. And just uh, by way of an introduction again, I am Commissioner Daryl Glenn and the majority of the Black Forest in the Burn area was in my Commissioner District and I've been heading up the recovery effort. And our goal is to, on a monthly basis, to try to check in with the community and try to monitor what's happening from a recovery standpoint. Uh, the county has taken the position of we are, we've been trying to work with our volunteer organizations to provide them with whatever assistance that they need, but we try to, on a monthly basis, give you some of the statistics that we're looking at with regard to recovery, some of the issues that we're facing as a county, but we want to make sure that we provide you with an opportunity to be able to talk to us about some of the things that are happening in the field. And we're planning on having these meetings every month until uh, our anniversary date. And I'm going to mention this later on, but January, I am targeting having our next lessons learned type of a session. Uh, and we're going to devote the entire meeting, and we're going to turn it over to you. Um, two reasons why I scheduled that for January. One, it's to be our six month point after the fire. But two, we'll be coming off of the holidays, and I really want to get some feedback from people to find out how things are progressing. So I'm going to use this meeting and next meeting, and we're going to try to really put out the word that we want people to come in and talk to us in January and share those lessons, because our goal is to be able to work with our recovery managers and, and produce some information uh, in June as a lessons learned document, because what we're seeing, there are a lot of communities across the United States that are looking to El Paso County for leadership you know, unfortunately, we've had two straight years of fires, and floods, those types of things. So, you know, they're really looking at some of the processes that we have in place. Plus, you know, our interactions with the community. I'm really proud of a lot of the organizations and what they're doing. So, again, January, we're really going to try to push that hard to uh, really open up the place, provide an opportunity for people to give us some really good feedback on, on how things are going. Uh, so with that, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and have a couple of report items. The quicker we get through these things, the more uh, opportunity we'll have to provide for open public comment. Uh, some of these might not change. So the first recovery report are like citizen service support requests. And basically what that is is uh, we've set up a process. If there are concerns that are out there in the community, we have a way of tracking those particular issues so that we make sure that we identify what are the areas of concerns, but we also want to log them in and make sure that we close them out and get that information to you. So I'm going to look to our Public Services Division. Do we have any updates in this particular area? There, there, uh, there has only been one change to that. There was one request from a, uh, a citizen who had, for whatever reason, where it came from, don't know, but a pile of dirt that was left on is now former home site and was asking if he could get some help to remove that so he could get contractors into his property and we did take care of that the next day. Okay. That's the only change from last month that I'm aware of. Great. And, and we are encouraging people. Uh, we have a lot of organizations out in the community that are helping, but if you just don't know where to go, give us a call, go to our website, submit a question, and we will address those and get back to you. Our second area is uh, with our, our regional building and our development services. Do we have representatives from that? And if you would like to grab the gears of the microphone up here, if you want to hang on to that and pass it around. We are taping these things, and please share with your neighbors and friends that if they aren't able to attend these meetings, all these meetings are taped and they're posted on our website. Uh, Mark, if our development services is coming through. You flipped it off? I did not. You can turn it on. <laughs> Uh, it should work. It should show it's green, should it? It's just working? Yes. yes. <laughs> wow. Sensitive. Uh, all we've reported on the past is building permit updates and followed with the regional building department. Also want to make sure our, site, our modified site plan process is working acceptable for the residents. Um, we've mentioned before that we have a simplified site plan where we can handle multiple buildings in a, a single site plan drawing. Um, for that reason, some of our numbers will differ from what Roger may present for regional building, but uh, our records for this morning show 93 single family dwellings. We've issued site plan approvals for rebuilding um, and 48 additions to property that may be rebuilt, maybe an additional bedroom, could be in some cases perhaps even a guest house in the back of a property where the property was burned. 
Um, we have a number of other permits, but the, the actual number of those is irrelevant since everything is combined into a single one fee application. Any questions? Good evening, Roger Lovell with Regional Building. <coughs> uh, Mark's correct, our numbers are, are a bit different, but they're they're close. Uh, you know, there's gonna be some differences, I'm sure, in, in you know, I'm dealing with, with hard permit numbers, numbers that, that have been permitted. So, uh, as of right now, we've had 82 uh, new single family homes permitted. Of those 82, uh, 75 are site-built houses, seven are, are modular houses or uh, manufactured homes. Um, so, you know, outside of that, we are starting to see the, the volume of, of projects being submitted is definitely starting to pick up. I think people are starting to get through the, through the phase of figuring out what they want to do, and now plans are really starting to come in. Turnaround times, as far as plans go, it's, it's a great time of the year to do it because traditionally this is when plans kind of taper off seasonally anyway. So. Um, we're staffed up, we're ready to go. The turnaround times for a new home that's submitted through, through regional building is going to be under a week. Uh, and if there are any projects, especially Black Forest homes, that are not moving along quickly or you have any trouble with them, please contact us. Please feel free to contact me um, and, and I'll do whatever I can to make sure that project is moving along and, and going. Really, I haven't heard of any problems. Doesn't mean there aren't any, but if there are, we sure want to do what we can to, to assist with those problems. Question. Sure. 82 new since when? Since since the date of the fire. So, that, so not since last month. But correct. That's uh, And oh. if you'd like, I can get you the number last <coughs> month. Oh, I'm just uh, curious. That's 82 new homes. Those are 82 homes that were destroyed. That doesn't include new homes that are being built in the Black Forest that may have been planned before the fire ever hit in unaffected areas. I believe last month the report was about 49. Did it really double? Uh, um, I wasn't double? here. Mindy was here and gave that report. But yes, that's that's probably a fair statement. And we saw very similar numbers with the Waldo Canyon fire. Kind of slow at first, and then, you know, then it starts it starts coming in. Will so, you be staying till the end for questions? Because I know sure. the Commissioner likes to move on with the agenda. Absolutely. I'm surprised you're allowing these questions. Uh, because mine would have been on soil. I like soil you, <laughs> <laughs> um, So you'll be here till the end? Absolutely. Okay. Yep. All right. Thank you. Okay, and actually I'll turn this over to Max. We're going to move to our infrastructure repair update. Can I work without a microphone? You can do whatever you would like. As long as I can hear you. I'm sure I can be heard. Okay, my name is Max Kirschbaum. I'm the operations <coughs> manager here with Public Services, and I'd like to use this opportunity to just give a, a snapshot of the work that our highway section has done since the last meeting, and then the next slide will show you what we intend to do uh, before the next meeting. Um, this is this represents really. It's only been three weeks to the day since we had this last meeting, so this is uh, three work weeks worth of work. Um, we, our, our normal level of uh, pothole patching and sweeping, this is the time of year where we, do, we can do some catch up, so you're seeing some of that. Uh, we have our shouldering crew, shouldering machine, which <coughs> you would see looks like a, uh, uh, an orchestra of trucks and a machine, and, and uh, we're parading through uh, various roads in the Black Forest. Add to that list, I know we did Higby yesterday. Um, taking care of some shoulder issues, which is normal erosion, but also kind of exacerbated by the flooding. Uh, ditching, uh, since by now I would have expected we would have had several snow events under our belt. We don't, so that's given us more work days to catch up on ditch and culvert cleaning. And you see here we've hit more than 20 roads trying to restore some of the shaping of the ditches and uh, flushing out uh, the culverts. Um, mowing is complete for the season, thankfully, because now our fleet of mowers 
uh, which is only five, uh, are all to the southeast part of the county dealing with the crisis of the month, which is tumbleweeds. <laughs> we are mowing them, we are plowing them, we are grading them, we're rolling and crushing them. We've tried just about everything, but if you've seen that on the news, otherwise it's hard to believe, but I could show you pictures, you know, road, roads that are eight feet deep in them. It's, it's truly unbelievable. And the wind has shifted three times in the last week, 90 degrees, so they just moved from the east-west road to the north-south roads and back and forth, and it's, it's been kind of a losing battle. So that's where all of our mowers are. I mean, thankfully, we were done with our normal mowing. Uh, sign upgrade, I think I mentioned that we had that underway the last time. Sign upgrade at the at that 90 degree corner of Old Ranch and Milam is now complete. Should be a safer situation for people who are less familiar with that hard curve. Our uh, routine greater maintenance, uh, we've hit more than 10 roads in the Black Forest in the last three weeks and um, believe it or not uh, you know it's, it's a lot of your damage was caused not only by fire but by floods but we're already back into very dry and drought conditions we haven't had moisture in two months which means our our routine blade maintenance is not nearly as effective as it usually is when it's dry um, we can knock down uh, corrugations in the road, the washboarding, a few days later they'll be back. And uh, so that's, that too is a battle. Uh, I just don't have enough water tankers to accompany all the blades to, to wet down the roads and do it the way they'd like to. And uh, again, usually by this time we've had a few snows and I rely on the snow to be that source of water to do better blade maintenance. So. It's not as effective as it would ordinarily be. And uh, here I'm a little less specific on where we'll be, but again, the kinds of work that we'll be working on in December, as long as the weather allows, we're going to continue to shape the ditches and flush culverts. Um, the, the, the blades will be in their normal work areas doing routine uh, gravel road maintenance. We will continue uh, shouldering work. We should be on uh, the, the northern part of Black Forest Road here shortly. This is our active uh, season for crack sailing. We started about two weeks ago and uh, we'll be doing that for the next four to five months on the uh, asphalt roads and snow removal sooner or later. Any questions for me? Okay. Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now I'm going to uh, move to our county engineering. And something that I've added uh, as a change to their particular presentation, we're going to start talking about stormwater. This is a huge issue that we're having a community discussion. And uh, we want to start laying the groundwork for educating people on some of the areas of concern that we have. And I'm actually working with a regional task force pulling together a presentation for my commissioner district. And I'm planning on hosting three town hall meetings once I have that uh, together starting next year. But it's a pretty extensive issue that we have to deal with. And I think that the more information that we can provide, the better off we're going to be. But I'm going to have. Uh, we're going to start that conversation right now. Hi, good afternoon or good evening. <laughs> I'm Jennifer Urban and I'm uh, with County Engineering and I'm the Engineering Services Manager. Andre Bracken, the County Engineer, is unable to be here tonight. So I wanted to start off with a couple projects just to let you know. Uh, the work completed in, in November and um, uh, this is a project that we started before the fire, as you um, well know, but um, this is the Black Forest Burgess intersection, and um, it's complete at this point. We still have a few items that were left to do, but um, substantially complete, and all the traffic controls taken down, and uh, we're still working on some of the signal timing, but continue to um, work on that, and um, heard, heard a lot of good feedback in regards to that project. 
And then the second project that we started, um, prior to the, prior to the um, fire, is our Hodgin Road project. And we're wrapping that up. And, and what you'll see here in the next couple weeks is we're getting all the um, final signing, signing and striping completed. And what will make a lot of people happy, I think, in the Black Forest area is we'll be take, taking down that temporary um, traffic control and we'll be uh, putting all this new speed limit signs up so you won't have to go 35 through the entire area. And um, that will be completed towards the end of next week. So um, we will still have some shouldering work going on and some final signage, um, and some final um, seating. Um, but that work will be on the shoulder and we'll be just putting it up, um, traffic control up during the day and then taking it down during the evening when work is not being done. And then um, uh, what I'm going to talk about next is a little bit of update of the work in progress and stormwater issues and concerns. So um, I think last month Andre did a good presentation on the project of Casey Lane and this is the box culvert that got washed out. In, um, in August and we were able to go ahead and put the box in and open up the road to the residents on Casey Lane. But what we've been doing since um, last month is completing the wing walls and doing some of the work off the roadway. So we anticipate completion of that work in December. We're also continuing, and I don't have a slide on this, but we're also continuing the design for the culvert that we're worried on, on shoot just east of, <coughs> east of Casey Lane. And we anticipate to be able to um, start uh, replacing that culvert in the first quarter of next year. And then I think which uh, one of the issues which is a, a large concern to uh, the community in the Black Forest is uh, the hazard tree removal. I know Andre has talked extensively about this last month. Um, we have received funding to remove hazard trees within the right-of-way, adjacent to the right-of-way and on parks property in the county. So we anticipate to um, award a contract uh, for um, that work in December. We, have, we are hiring a contractor to oversee that contractor and to complete public outreach. And so what you'll be seeing here in the next couple of months is that we'll be creating websites, we'll be um, doing public outreach, and we'll be sending letters and information to the affected property owners. And um, just speaking a little bit about the stormwater issue, as you know, here in El Paso County, um, what we have seen lately is that our existing infrastructure that has already, that is already problematic by the fires and the floods, you'll see how that, you have seen how that issue has been exasperated. <coughs> we have stormwater infrastructure that is outdated, undersized and inadequate and we have inadequate funding to be able to um, complete new projects and inadequate funding to maintain the stormwater infrastructure that we have. So starting last year our commissioner started a dialogue in the community and talked about, talked to the city and we've been having a dialogue over the past year about what to do about this issue and recommendations have come out um, and we, we have a task force formed and to look at those issues and to identify um, a solution. And one of those solutions has been a regional stormwater, one of those solutions that has come forward has been a regional stormwater effort. And so over the next um, year, we expect to have additional um, meetings in regards to that. And it's what Commissioner Glenn was talking about. So. Um, we have, and I didn't bring it with me today, but we have a website and we can get that out on um, a website and contact information for those who want to get engaged in that issue. And, and let, me, let me also piggyback on that topic because if there is a task force. Uh, you've heard the mayor of Colorado Springs has a proposal. Um, the, the regional task force has a proposal. And we're in a period right now where we're trying to harmonize those to see if there is a, a way that we can move forward. There is, we do not have an official recommendation yet as far as uh, a funding approach, 
my sense is that there is momentum to potentially put something on the ballot, or at least request to put something on the ballot for 2014. Um, but my concern is that I want to make sure that we are able to articulate the entire stormwater issue um, before we do that from an educational standpoint. Because if you're upstream, you have a different view of stormwater than if you're downstream. Uh, so I've been working with our task force to kind of, one, I think it's very important that we identify as a region what our stormwater problem is for El Paso County as a whole. And then we have different towns and municipalities that make up El Paso County. And I think it's very clear that we need to identify what is the particular impact that the particular town or municipality has on the overall stormwater system. And then once you identify that impact, you want to work with that town and find out well, what is your current plan on how you're going to deal with your stormwater runoff. And if, there, if your funding is inadequate, what is your plan to fill that gap? And if you don't have a plan for that, that's where you might want to consider uh, an intergovernmental agreement working with other people to try to close that gap. But I think it's important that we need to be able to explain why stormwater is important and how that connects to our water supply. Um, you know, our water, we pump that up from Pueblo, and it is our water, and we have a 1041 permit that requires us to do certain things uh, from the city of Colorado Springs in order to be able to protect the quality of the water. So it's a big issue. It's, it's not a real sexy topic, for lack of a better way of saying that, but when, in my opinion, when you start thinking about economic development and being able to judge the quality of the community, if you do not have the ability to handle your water supply and provide water, that's going to be a huge economic driver. So we have some major challenges ahead. I, do not, I have not taken a position on this, but I just want to make sure that the story is accurately told. And my commitment to the regional task force is to have three town hall meetings within uh, my district and I'm at these meetings after we provide you with that presentation, I'm going to ask you to give me feedback as far as, based on the recommendation, is this something that you agree we should do? For example, if the recommendation is to come forward and request a, either a tax increase, either property tax, sales tax, or fee increase, is that something that you would support? Um, because I know upstream, you know, the question is going to be, well, if 80% of the problem sits within the city of Colorado Springs, why are you asking me upstream to subsidize that particular effort? What is the return on investment? And so there are a lot of questions that are going to be asked. I want to make sure that they're properly vetted. But you have my commitment to make sure that we have a detailed discussion about that. So now we're going to move on to item E, and that's our uh, community volunteer efforts and our county parks with Kim Morgan. Hey everyone, I am Tim Walker, Director of Community Services for El Paso County. I'm going to give you a brief update on what we've talked about the last couple of meetings. Um, if you'll recall, we have talked about the possibility of trying to keep the Splash Mall facility open um, throughout the winter months. And our, our model was to approach a, a contractor who would be willing to come out on site, operate the Splash Mall facility through April of 2014, and then our SAMCOM board would take back over and do that. We put together an RFP after a discussion at our last meeting, and many of you have uh, joined us on talking about that. And we were trying to balance between what would a contractor be willing to do, able to do, be able to actually make potentially some money, and could we also open up on Saturdays for the general public to be able to arrange their slash out there as well. We had our pre-bid last week. We only had one contractor show. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't required. They don't have to be there, but we're opening tomorrow. And, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm not sure we're going to be overwhelmed with the response. It's kind of an unusual situation here of, you know, operating it during the winter months, and it's only about a four-month period, and so, but I think it was much, very much worth a try to be able to do this, and we will know tomorrow whether we're successful with that or not. And if so, our goal will be to work very quickly with that contractor to have them reopen the facility on Saturdays for drop-off. Um, but once again, uh, we hope we're overwhelmed with bids. I don't know that that'll be the case, but uh, we'll find out tomorrow. And just a couple of uh, park updates. Uh, as you recall, last month we talked about the, the playground at Black Forest Regional Park. We're still looking for a volunteer group to help us out on a couple of Saturdays or weekdays if they're available. We've got 
some additional prep work to do on that playground. So if you know of an Eagle Scout or a nonprofit organization that would like to spend some time at a Black Horse Regional Park, help us with that playground. We would greatly appreciate that. Uh, we don't find uh, some volunteer groups in the next couple of weeks. We'll probably go to a Plan B and we'll determine what that will be. Uh, but once we have that uh, cleanup work done, we'll come back and reinstall the file or the playground material below there and then reopen that site, which our children in the Black Forest are anxious for us to do. So we'd like to do that as soon as we can. So anybody has any thoughts on volunteer groups willing to spend a little time at the Black Forest, please uh, contact me. My email address will be on the next slide coming up, and uh, or I'll be here after the meeting as well, too. Uh, the other major issue we've been dealing with is the burned area assessment report that did go to the Park Advisory Board on November the 13th, and that was endorsed by the Park Advisory Board. That essentially is really our foundation of what our next steps will be in regards to the burned areas within the county park system. And you see one through five are kind of the next upcoming goals with that foundation being established, updating forest management plans and trail plans, uh, trying to address additional erosion issues within the county parks, Talking about volunteer projects, and as I related to you in the past, we've been quite blessed with a variety of groups coming out and assisting us, which we greatly appreciate. Uh, finalizing our, our work with our, our third-party contractors and uh, funding support, and then also raising funds for our local matches and also other types of projects as well. So as we anticipate snow starting to come in, we probably won't be incredibly active the next six or eight weeks, but we'll be planning for activities then for 2014. I think we've made some pretty good progress in our county parks over the last several months, and many are back open again, many trail systems are back open again, but still got a ways to go. Um, so if you're interested in staying involved with us, we greatly appreciate that. And once again, I will stay after the meeting tonight and to talk to anybody about parks or the same facility. So, thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, next area we're going to talk about our recovery workshops and our mentor connection activities. And we've officially handed that off. And um, we have a new representative now that's going to be leading our mentor connection activities. I'm sure he has some great words of wisdom for us. <laughs> I think I'll try to do this All without right. the uh, microphone. Hi, right. right, good evening. Uh, my name's Paul Helm. And so I'm, I'm presenting uh, our report uh, on behalf of Peggy Littleton, who, who led our effort last night, and also on behalf of the uh, Black Forest Together group, uh, as we, uh, we pretty much wrapped up the mentoring sessions where we had the Wallow Canyon uh, folks that graciously came down from Black, or up to the Black Forest and did provide some lessons learned, and wonderful things came out of that. But so now I'm stepping up and taking that uh, those sessions over, we're calling that Black Forest Connections. And I think we had a pretty successful meeting last night. Uh, again, to roll this out, we're bringing our subject matter experts, and we're bringing volunteers, and we're going to continue to reach out to the Walden Canyon folks. In fact, they, they provide some really good uh, insightful information about how to deal with uh, insurance uh, for folks for uh, partial loss. And that seems like that's the biggest issue for the folks with insurance or the partial loss. A lot, a lot of paperwork is required for that. Uh, so we had hey, other, other uh, subject matter experts. We had legal support. We had the uh, <clears throat> regional uh, building department representative there uh, and, and some, some others. Uh, connected some folks together. Seemed to have uh, some pretty good interaction. Uh, I, I plan to have our meetings probably on a more routine basis as opposed to uh, every four weeks. Hopefully, uh, maybe that will spawn off uh, a little bit more often and depending on the, on the needs of the community. Uh, also, on a side project, I, I work for the Air Force. And I have noticed since my involvement that the Air Force community is huge in this, this town that are willing to, uh, to pull together volunteers to help us. And I'm really hoping that we're going to have a really watershed moment where we get a lot of volunteers from the military community to come out and meet our needs in the community. Uh, I have three uh, Boy Scout troop leaders that are tied into the region wanting to help on parks. They have, they, they are Eagle Scout instructors, so I, I, I will be making that contact. And uh, uh, So we also have a campaign where we're hoping to adopt Black Forest families that are having special needs for the holidays. And, and again, our goal is to find all those, those families with unmet needs and to connect with volunteers that can make their, their uh, holidays a more happy holiday. Especially <coughs> ideas for children and, and, and you know, providing clothes and whatnot. But, 
That's all I have. And I, I do have some meeting minutes if you'd like a copy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next item is our legislative support activities. If anybody on our legislative committee has any updates, Neil, do you want to say anything at this point in time, or you're you're good? No, I think I'm good. Okay, great. Thank you. Next item is our financial resources. Uh, I had some input for legislative, and I thought somebody might be here. Sure. So, um, I don't know whether you want me to wait for the public comment. Is it, is it now? Why don't we hold off on that? Okay. Because it's we'll a proposal. It's basically a proposal for some legislative action. Okay. Sure. Let's let's hold off for that. Um, financial resources and assistance program. The only update that I had, and, and um, the FEMA assistance deadline, I just saw an email that has been, with regard to the disaster flood assistance, that's been extended to December 2nd. Has that word been uh, sent out? Has everybody heard that? Because I know if we're going to send that out by way of a press release, but if that is a concern to people, that new deadline is now December 2nd. And if there are any questions or concerns, feel free to uh, contact me directly or come talk to me after this meeting. Uh, now we're to the uh, portion of the agenda where we uh, deal with any issues that we have with our nonprofits that we're working with. Do we have anybody, a representative, come on forward? Make sure you introduce yourself. You are a great partner that we've been working with and we've been doing a fantastic job. Thank you. Have you made the microphone? Um, I don't think so. Okay. If you can't hear me, tell me. <laughs> My name is Carrie Olivier, and I am a Waldo Canyon survivor, partial loss person, who became involved through that with United Policyholders, which is a 501c3 non-for-profit uh, consumer advocacy group that helps people in disaster recovery and dealing with insurance claims for major loss. So education, support, um, encouragement and uh, and just connecting resources for the financial side of recovery where insurance is involved and we have been doing along with the county um, a roadmap to recovery program and we're about to have our sixth um, meeting which is going to be on December 5th from um, 6 to 8 p.m. and this is we are having them every month usually the first Thursday in January it'll be the second Thursday because it's January 2nd so um, at Woodman Valley Chapel off of Mark Scheffel and Woodman and they've been wonderful to provide that facility for us and Nancy's been taping them and um, so those Sessions, those work sessions are um, and presentations are on the county's website as well as United Policyholders. We're going to um, change a little from our sort of lecture and question and answer format this month and have something that we're going to call a milestone gathering. You know, as we, um, those of us that are, are helping with this effort, um, interact with people and remember where we were just a year ago in Waldo Canyon, um, people are tired and we look out in the audience and it's kind of flat. It's hard to absorb information. The holidays are coming. It's just seems like a really long road and it is a long road. However, just like on any long road, you have to take rest stops and mark your progress. And there is progress in Black Forest, and there is progress in every single claim, um, in every person that's out there in the audience. They just don't always feel it. So we are going to do that and then also offer all of the speakers and experts that have been in previous <coughs> workshops, in the six workshops, are going to be there, and it's going to be a casual mixer so that everyone can kind of have one-on-one -on -one conversation and then they will set up um, tables in the periphery of the atrium there and so for example the um, legal advice that has come alongside and volunteered help the um, people that do uh, property uh, inventory claim help will be there um, we'll have a few contractors there um, we'll have a few mortgage company type um, construction loan fund control advisor people there 
and hopefully some county people there, and then we'll be there. So they can sign up for 10 minute sort of individual consults with people. And, uh, and so I hope you will encourage people to come to this. I think we're gonna have some food and be able to hook people up. I th one of the most important things we've found, um, and I've learned this myself and also through the people who have been volunteering with UP for 10 years after their loss, is the community, is learning from being with other people that are going through the same thing. So the mentoring is great. I'm so glad that's going to continue. And we are encouraging the same thing. We have groups of people who, through contacting us, we are putting together partial loss groups, inventory groups. We're going to be working with um, Black Force together to train helpers for people that are stuck on their documenting their claims. So if they have someone trusted, they can come um, and be trained uh, in the information about how to work best with their insurance company to get the result that they need to get and to get those dollars to help them move forward and to get remembering their law, focusing on their loss behind them and start focusing on the future and living their lives again. So thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, December 5th. Yeah. December 5th, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. at Woodman Valley on Mark Sheffel. And, uh, and thank you for your hard work. Do we have any other nonprofits that want to give an update tonight? Do we have a representative from Black Force together? Are you? <clears throat> yes, I had no other inputs for that. I do have, because they don't have a representative, I have an action item for Black Force together. I received a phone call probably about an hour before I came here from news media. And for whatever reason, there were some concerns with regard to, um, they want to be able to uh, have a session where they can look at how money is being spent with regard to sure. Black Force together. Uh, I'm going to actually schedule that as an agenda item for December so that they have an opportunity to think about a presentation but I don't like to have rumors float around Absolutely. in the community. And I know how hard Black Force Together has been working. So uh, I think that it would be helpful if a representative would come in, kind of talk through the process of once they receive a, a donation, basically open their books right. so people have a level of confidence so that we can uh, deal with that particular hey, issue. Commissioner Glenn, I'm the Ralph Johnson, President of Black Force Together. Good. Thank you. Um, we're going up, so we can hear it, we can get on. And I don't know if you want to address it, but I don't like to uh, catch people off guard, especially if there's yeah, a president. I, I don't need the microphone. Okay. Again, I'm Ralph Townsend, I'm the president of Black Forest Together. Um, we're, we have open books, we're glad to answer any questions. We're really in the process of giving a long-range plan of how to distribute the, the money. We work with a lot of other nonprofits, and because they can't distribute it between individuals, they're working through us, Aspen Point Catholic Charities, and a lot of groups. We really haven't distributed much right now as we're trying to get a long-range plan and, and where to give it out. But we're open, book come down to our office at the fire station in Black Forest, or call us or email. We'd be glad to you know, tell you what we're doing. And if we're on agenda, we can yeah. talk next time. I would like to do it that way. It gives you an opportunity to come in and prepare. Just that way, other people, if they had any concerns, they can. Yeah. I mean, the only thing I ask is that we do it with all the nonprofits we're working with uh, in the Black Forest. So it's across the board. So everybody's willing to show what they're doing. And we'll be happy to do that. Absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. Appreciate that. Any other nonprofits? We'll come back. We're almost to. to and then we'll come back to your question. Okay. Uh, I do want to go over some uh, upcoming meetings. Tomorrow is a very important meeting. If you have not heard, that we are having our work session on the fire codes. That is a 10.30 start time at the Board of County Commissioners uh, Auditorium, 200 South Cascade. I know this has been a very uh, important topic out in the community. Uh, the work session is, is designed to allow representatives from the Housing and Building Association to present um, their view of the proposed amendments to the uh, fire code 
and also gives an opportunity for the fire districts. I'm sure they'll have a representative uh, present, um, you know, kind of talk through the amendment process. Because there's been so much misinformation that's out there. We finally have the subject matter experts that are going to be in front of us to kind of, we will not be voting on, on, on these particular amendments tomorrow, but it's going to be an open dialogue so that we can ask questions and they can present information. Citizens will be allowed to ask questions. Typically, we do not allow that during work sessions, but due to the level of concern with regard to this, we are making an exception. So that is a 10.30 start time for that. Um, on December 10th, that is the date that we're actually going to be voting on the proposed amendment. So those are two very important dates. And that December 10th, it doesn't have a start time, it's just going to be part of our normal agenda, so you have to just track that on the agenda. But we will be making a decision on December 10th with regard to the proposed amendments. Uh, you've already heard of December 5th United Policyholder Workshop, so I, I encourage people to attend that. And then our next uh, Long Range Recovery Meeting will be December 18th. We typically, the goal is going to be the last Wednesday of the month once we get through the holidays, but uh, just for planning purposes, December 18th will be the next meeting like this. And I try to send out a copy of the agenda uh, uh, the one new uh, item that we'll have for next month will ask for uh, some nonprofit reports, and I will send that out. Uh, are there any other items that I'm missing as far as from a calendar standpoint? Okay, seeing that, we're going to move to our other announcements. So we do have a uh, unique presentation. We have John Anderson that's going to uh, spend some time with us and uh, give us an update on this uh, Union uh, Indian prayer trees. Thank you, Commissioner Glenn. I appreciate the uh, sure. opportunity to be here. Would you like the microphone? Um, let me know if I need it. I think <laughs> I, my voice will carry. I did bring uh, a few slides, but I meant to show up uh, ahead of time and cue those up. But my daughter was in the middle of a basketball game, so I walked in about 10 minutes late. So I don't know if we have the slides there or not. Um, do you have them like on a flash drive? Uh, yeah, but it'll take me a few minutes. I think what I'll do is just go ahead and talk through it if that's okay. <laughs> and I'll leave my uh, email and cell number up here. And if anybody would like those sent to you, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, how many of you are familiar with, well, I'm preaching the choir. I see Judy here and Ralph and Jim and Tim. And I know a lot of your staff. How many of you are familiar with culturally modified trees, sometimes referred to as CMTs? And uh, they're all over the world and probably have been as long as man's been interacting with trees. And they're used for a variety of different purposes, medicinal or, or um, uh, educational uh, uh, purposes. In North America, probably the most common are the uh, Native American uh, trail marker trees. They've been identified in 40 states. Uh, they extend from Canada all the way to uh, northern, New Me northern Mexico, from the Atlantic probably to the Pacific here. Here in the, the Pikes Peak region, we probably have one of the richest clusters of uh, Ute uh, Indian prayer trees. And out of all of the ones that I've seen, probably the greatest concentration is in Black Forest. Sadly, we have lost with the fire an untold number. I, I put counting because it just it just uh, breaks your heart to sit that walk and see one chart. I did get to the uh, Hayman fire, which was again 10 years ago. And I was pleased to see that some of the old uh, ponderosas have recovered there. So maybe there's a, there's a prayer for some of these prayer trees. But the, um, the, the bark on, on the ponderosa is much thicker, much more durable than, than I had realized. So we'll keep our fingers crossed with some of those. But the um, uh, Ute Indian were the, the longest continuing Native American here in the Pikes Peak region. In fact, there are sites in Judy's wonderful book that talks about different sites. I think it's your book. that talks about some on the northern side of um, uh, El Paso County and the um, uh, Cherokee Trail that came through here. And there's been sites that have been recorded to be 12 and 13,000 years old. On, uh, in Teller County, even 12 and 14,000 years old. So the youth, Native Americans uh, presence, most of those, or many of those can be traced back to the youth and the basket uh, weaver. But when we first made contact in uh, the, the early um, uh, 1850s, 1860s, the Ute were, were prominent here because this was their home. There were a lot of other native tribes, the Arapaho and the Cheyenne and the Sioux that would come and go and Comanche at some extent. 
But the youth are who we believe uh, we can attribute the majority of the culturally modified trees here in the Black Forest region. And if you've not seen them, you probably have seen them and not realized that. But they're, uh, they're just a, a wonderful specimen of what the, the youth were able to do with the trees. Many of them come out of the ground and, and travel across the ground, some, some four or five feet long uh, laterally. And then they'll, they'll ascend up towards the crater and, and what the, the youth believe were, were, um, uh, they were investment. Some were uh, uh, marked with peeled bark. Uh, many times in the, in, the, in the bends, you can see where there was a tie down mark where they were staked down. Many of them point towards Pikes Peak or Tava, the, the mountain that they uh, cherished. It was a sacred place because the sun rose there first. So those of you who have seen uh, an early morning sunrise with uh, Pikes Peak, you know why that was a special place. Those of you that chose to live in Black Forest know why that's a special place. Uh, one of the things uh, that I did have the distinct privilege of doing in the research that I've been doing on the Ute Indian prayer trees was get a, a, an opportunity to meet uh, a number of uh, the, Ute, the Ute elders in um, Ignacio, which is the southern Ute uh, reservation down along the uh, New Mexico border. The Ute's the only Native Americans that still have a presence here in uh, Colorado and, and in the Four Corners area. But what we were able to do with Lafrey and Ralph's uh, kind of uh, uh, generosity was to bring 15 representatives of the Southern Ute uh, tribe back here to northern El Paso County and hosted the very first annual Ute Indian Prayer Tree Retreat. And it was really a, a very heartwarming uh, event. And uh, uh, some of the elders were, were familiar with the trees. Some had been here to Black Forest. But many of the younger people had no idea that their native ancestors had cultivated theirs. And there's just some wonderful uh, stories and, and uh, events that go around the ceremonies with, with the trees. So the only comment I wanted to get in, and I'll uh, see if there's any questions, Commissioner, is to let you know if you've got any unusual bent or marked or disfigured trees and you're having to clear you know, some areas, uh, be very careful. You may be cutting something down that is really rich in culture and history. The last youths were um, forced on the reservation in 1880 with the youth agreement, but for the most part, by the time uh, uh, Colorado became a territory, 1861, uh, the Ute having free access to the Black Forest area was very restricted. So, so most of the trees that have been cored in Colorado for dating, uh, the, the CMTs are between 1815 and 1858. And that test was done about uh, uh, 30 years ago. There's not been a lot of recent coring, thankfully. But, but we um, I do know that there are some that go back several hundred years. And the, the ponderosas will live to be 800 years old, and we believe that there's probably some here in the Black Forest that are about 450 and maybe 500, 550 years old. So there are some really wonderful, rich parts of uh, our history. I know with Tim and some of his staff, we've had some discussions with Jason about maybe trying to mark some of the trails, particularly in Fox Run, so that people have of interest, and, and now the word's starting to get out with, with a group of people who are, are committed. Uh, to, uh, to share in this. Uh, I'll extend one invitation that thankfully uh, Mr. Jim Reed in the back has taken uh, me up on and his, and his children and uh, some other people are joining us for a Ute Indian prayer tree hike on uh, Saturday at 1 o'clock. If you'd like to go, we'd love to have you come along. It's about a two mile, uh, about, about a little under two hours, but we meet at the Fox Run Trailhead on Roller Coaster Road just south from back, uh, from back uh, just south of Baptist Road, right, like about an eighth of a mile there on the west side. So if you want to go, please come along, bring some hiking boots and a bottle of water and dress in layers, and you're going to see uh, three or four different varieties, probably several dozen of the Ute Indian prayer trees, and they are really a, really a special treasure, we, we think, here in El Paso County. So we're trying to get the word out that you know, the more people know about them, the more likely they'll be here for the next uh, several hundred years for generations to enjoy. Are there any questions that you might have of me? What yes. time uh, one o'clock, one to three, Saturday afternoon. And again, I, I'll leave uh, my cell number, and if you want the slide presentation, I'll be happy to send those to you. Great. And, and definitely stick around afterwards, because people might have a question. Oh, thank you. I'm you sure that wasn't a two-mile run, Jim? Who else is I'm Just checking. <laughs> but, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, we will now open it up for any public comment on any topic. So um, you know, feel free to come forward since we, if you have a question, you come forward so that we can get you on camera, ask your question, and we need the microphone, it's here too. So this is your time.
I'm Rich Mayer. I lost everything on fire. Sometime after the, uh, we got back in, people started uh, receiving notices from the county assessor because they took an effort to do some adjustments. And a number of us thought they were not sufficient. And so I started talking to a number of people and, and eventually Larry Stanley, who is a close friend, is the treasurer of Black Forest Together. And he's a, a good financial guy. So he and I teamed up and went and had a meeting with the county assessor. And the, the, the goal of this was to find out why more could not be done. And for the most part, the bottom line was Colorado statutes limited or tied their hands so as to speak, in, in a manner that didn't allow them to do what maybe they would like to do. And so Larry and I um, uh, have nearly completed a draft, and uh, the legislative subcommittee that what used to meet, I had mentioned that this was happening and we were working on it. So that committee doesn't meet anymore, so I, I was hoping we would get the chance to talk about it here. So I'm just telling you that what we expect to do is um, use what we'll call as our non-legalese concept of what we think is needed and hand that off to Senator Lambert Great. and Representative Stevens and see if they can say, we can get behind this and put the appropriate legalese behind it and move it through the state. And, and basically, uh, the assessor was all for this, and it can be something as simple as, given certain disaster parameters, the county assessors are given a greater leeway in using variety of formula and methods to adjust property values. It could be something as simple as that, you know, however you would legally use that. But the idea is right now they're highly constrained and they cannot go and do very much. In fact, the assessor said what he had done, and if any of you had received adjusted values, um, he, is, he feels he's somewhat out on the limb by doing what he did, but nobody has really come to beat him up. There's an audit that's done from the state on the assessments. And they go in and, and are really hard-nosed about following those rules. And so he's trying to uh, do the best he can and still be able to defend that audit. And he feels he's kind of out in the, the gray area right now. So the idea is we think, particularly with the fires, the floods, the floods up north, that we need some kind of uh, flexibility given to the professionals who do this uh, at the assessor's office so that they are able to, to make some appropriate adjustment. I think one of the biggest problems that, that we face in Black Forest was how do you change the assessment of the property when you lose a lot of trees? Some people had a vast number of trees it, 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 and, and you can position it this way. You can say, okay, I lost my house. Well, that's pretty well quantified, and there's ways to do that, and the rules are fairly clear. But I lost all my trees. So does that mean it's now equivalent in value um, to a lot without trees? Well, if you haven't removed all those trees, then it's negative from that, because there is a big cost to remove those trees to get back to a so-called empty lot and potentially if you wanted to restore the trees another effort. So they realize this but there's no mechanisms for them to deal with this. And so what we're hoping is we want to try and, and get this kicked off by drafting some simple language, turning it over to those folks and, and hoping 
we get enough support that uh, they will take an action and move it forward. So I just wanted to, to brief everybody on that. And um, we can certainly share anything we hand to them. I have not been successful at getting a hold of Senator Lambert since the last meeting. Um, I guess the well, once you're ready, busy. Yeah, you're once you're ready, yeah, you send yeah. it to me. I can send it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, I just wanted to let you know that you know some of us are out here doing mm -hmm. some of the things that we can do, um, and I thought it was important because there's a you know there's a huge value loss in Black Forest. Why most of us live there is because of the forest. When you lose the forest, you lose a major piece of that, and it will take us a long time to fix that, to put it back, or you know do whatever to make it nice again. So one thing that can help us, I think, is a way to get our property values assessed in a, in a sane way. Good. Good. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right. I was going to say, come on, don't be bashful. Start making your way on up. So. Thank you. I'm Lori, and I lost my own Black Forest Fire. This question is probably more directed for you. Sure. Um, I'm anxious for the meeting, the work session. Can you give us um, some background? Uh, you mentioned all the permits that have been pulled so far before you've adopted any code changes. Was there any impact to those folks pulling permits before you adopt any code changes? Um, and maybe just kind of give us an overview of what we kind of committee expect from Thursday. Well, well, basically the rules that are in place right now, nothing has been been approved. I mean, the fire districts have, um, you know, adopted some of the proposed amendments that they would like incorporated into the new code. And in order to do that, they have to present those to the Board of County Commissioners for, uh, for approval. <coughs> but the rules that are in place right now are the ones that are, are governing any sort of rebuilding activity. Uh, so if we if proposed amendments and anybody from our, our staff can chime in, it would not have a retroactive effect. It would be for moving forward. But what you can expect for tomorrow, again, tomorrow is just an open discussion about the proposed amendments. And I really recommend that you attend and feel free to ask questions on your particular scenario. And again, we're going to take that into consideration. But December 10th, that's where we have a lot of options. Uh, we can uh, adopt the amendments. We can say, you know, we, there are a variety of different avenues that we can go down based on the feedback that we get at that point in time. So did any one of these 80-some permits have any changes that they needed to meet with, the, with their rebuilds? Are you asking as far as if the fire district had right. adopted mm -hmm. new amendments and whether or not it impacted those existing permits? Those new amendments are not incorporated until they're approved by the Board of County Commissioners, and that, those have not been approved today. Thank you. Is, is that work session going to be televised? You know, of, yeah, yes, it will be. Okay. Well, it won't be live streamed, <coughs> but you'll be, able, you'll be able to online, and then it'll be rebroadcast. Okay, because some of us can't get there. Right. Judy, you know, My question. My question is uh, what the procedure is going to be. If the commissioners should adopt this on the 10th of December, uh, then what? Do they instantly take effect or is there some delay until regional? Um, changes the code, and then there's another hearing. Or, you know, what happens? I don't have the I don't have the exact answer with regard to how quickly that's going to occur. But I'm assuming that it would be our normal process that once we uh, adopt certain rules and regulations, there's a certain deadline for those to go into effect. I know that we're probably going to end up having to harmonize whatever proposed amendments with our uh, development code. There there might be some other revisions, but then we. The one thing that the 10th will do, we'll establish some new guidelines. We're either going to be status quo or we'll be making some changes. We're going to at least be able to give some clear direction with regard to what is going to happen with the proposed amendments. Because a lot of people are trying to go through the process 
and some of them are having um, some concerns with regard to, well, these are some of the pro proposed amendments in this district, do I have to follow these? We're now going to be able to at least give you an answer with regard to what's the Board of County Commissioner's opinion with regard to did we go ahead and go through that process and adopt that as a, essentially a, a rule or regulation that you need to follow. So definitely uh, pay attention to tomorrow uh, and the December 10th we'll try to be as clear as possible and we, we're doing everything possible to not delay anything because this is an issue that I believe needs to be wrapped up and, and provide some guidance to the community. And if any of our staff reps can come in and save me if you want to add anything to what I said. Or we can just nod and say, press on. Press on. <laughs> press on, okay. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Sounds good to <laughs> All right, great. Yes, sir. Um, this is where I need to stand. Right there. That's why I don't need my question. Okay, good. Um, I got a couple questions. But sure. The first one is, is um, the slash and mulch helps mm -hmm. us deal with trees up to a certain size. Is there anything in the works to help deal with the larger trees? On private property or in private property? What are we doing with regard to that? I'm going to ask for help on that. I give, I, on private property, we're, we're, I'm sorry, I'm Jim Reed, I'm the director of public services. On private property, we can't, there's nothing we can do for you. I mean, it's just kind of out of our hands. However, um, if you're looking for tree services, um, I'm sure that we can sit down and maybe give you several examples of tree services that can go out and help you. And that's where we're at with that. Uh, most of those cost money. Right. People with larger lots, that isn't going to go very far. Right, and that's the, and the issue then is, is because of the money, uh, I don't know if some of the nonprofits are willing to help. Uh, if it's free firewood, uh, maybe you'll have some of them down and cut them down for you. But as far as the county goes, there's really not much we can do for you. So the slash program will still have a limit to you know, what size and what they'll deal with? Yes, yeah. because they're, they're limited by the equipment that they have. Right. Well, she's pointed that way. You can just kind of tease her, just so that she. Can. I'm just going to use that as Jackie, but um, I'm kind of what you're asking is the issue of wood utilization, where saw timber trees should become saw timber, and the smaller trees can become pallets, and our landscape timbers and the other junk trees can become firewood or chips. Okay, uh, there are private companies out there that will assist you with this. Um, it ain't going to be free. Um, that, that's one of the problems is everybody thinks all the forestry stuff should be free because the slash mulch sites thing is always going to increase. Okay, um, there's a wonderful uh, article that was written in Denver Post about by a uh, Denver Metro professor about living in the forest is not free. You know, you have to pay for some of these services. If you live in town, you pay for landscaping and do it yourself or, or whatever. And so uh, I would encourage you to uh, you talk to me afterwards. Sir, uh, Black Forest Mill is taking uh, lumber. Greenleaf is taking lumber. There's various places that have sawmills that are taking the larger trees. Some of it depends on how fast you think you need to cut them down. And then there's the argument that not all trees should be cut down. Some of this needs to be left on the land, either standing or down for forest recovery. We're not trying to create a bird. And the people that are clear cutting are running the risk of creating a wasteland if they don't get things to grow afterwards. So, you know, there's a lot of things to think about. It's a very complicated situation. So, I don't know if that helps or not. But there are people who are utilizing the trees for other purposes besides firewood and chips. So, okay. Um, the next question is, I don't know, I live next to a power line. Owned by Excel Energy, and I've had the pleasure recently of having them come through and drop a bunch of trees on my lot, um, where I already have to do a bunch of cleanup from the fire. Right. And I've been interacting with them, and I finally reached a stage where they've just flat out told me they are not going to clean up what they've done. They they've cut them down and just left them on your lot. They've cut them down and they've left them there, slashing everything. And I don't seem to have any recourse at this point. And partly, I'm wondering if there's anything we can do, you know, and, it, and probably not grandfathered, but it's rather irritating. Right. Um, it's a financial burden. Not only that, they were 
that they were healthy trees. And out of the ones I've measured so far, um, none of them would have hit the power line if it had been laying on the ground, and this is one of the big transmission lines that's you know, 30, 40 feet up in the air. Sure. Um, you know, what can we do about that? Is there any recourse from the county or anything, or can we work on the legislative side of changing the rules so they have to help with that? Right. Well, you know, we, we've been trying to encourage people to be good community partners. I mean, we can't compel them to do things like that. Uh, I think we've been successful in when we've had constituent concerns like that, making a phone call and seeing whether or not they would be willing to help out. We don't have a vehicle to compel them to do things in, in their right way. Uh, but uh, stick around after the meeting so we can get your information. And maybe we can have somebody make a phone call and say, hey, you know, I'm not the only one on that's running sure. this. No, I, I've heard no. I haven't heard any complaints like that from Mount View Electric. But you, 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 you the cells you do with the cell. cell. Okay. Give, give, yeah. cells yeah. Yeah. But give us, but give us your, uh, your information. We'll see what we can do. Any other uh, questions, comments? Well, again, I want to recap the plan again for, for January. And I'm, I'm going to hit this hard again in December just to really, we really want to have an opportunity in January to have a thorough lessons learned opportunity. I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to come in here, especially after the holiday. Give us some feedback uh, on how things are going uh, with regard to the entire recovery effort. Uh, I also want to, and I'll ask our staff, from their perspective, you know, there might have been some things that we just found out in interacting with them, new processes, new procedures that they might want to share some stories. So it's really going to be kind of informal, interactional, so that we can kind of share at their midway point. But the reason why I want to do it is if we need to make any course corrections, I want to be able to have plenty of opportunity to, to do that. So I want to again thank you for, for coming, and our next meeting again will be December 18th. And please go, join, uh, go to the work session tomorrow if you are available. Thank you very much.